Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Agahi with your host, Waris Azeh. As you know, this program is all about your psychological well-being and mental health. And we always invite guests that are mental health professionals from across the globe to talk about different topics, different issues that affects most of us. In today's episode of Agahi, we've got a really interesting topic lined up for you. And we have with us Sister uh, Maryam. Um, Grilla, who is an art therapist, and let's welcome her to our game. Salaam alaikum, sister. Alaikum salam, thank you for having me. An honor to have you. So I'm really excited for this topic because um, most people, as, as children, they have experienced some form of art. And um, I think most of us grew up drawing something or painting something. Some people even um, take up, take it up as a career in their, in their future life. But not many people are familiar with art therapy or art being therapeutic or to help us heal or help us cope with our daily life problems. So first of all, um, tell us, tell our viewers about the work that you do as a professional, as an art therapist, so we can get an understanding of what you do. Um, so I'm an art psychotherapist and I work in the community offering um, group art therapy to women that have experienced trauma. So my practice is trauma informed. So it's working with people to kind of rebuild and recover from those experiences of trauma that they've had. I also work in private practice and offer one to one art therapy and psychotherapy. So talking therapy to individuals as well. We hear about talking therapies a lot, um, and a lot of people have been to, say, for example, um, a cognitive behavior therapist or a counselor, but not many people have been to an art psychotherapist. So what kind of problems or what kind of issues um, people can um, approach you with to seek help? I mean, people have art therapy for a number of different issues. So within the NHS, it's quite commonplace to have an art therapist or an arts therapist that could work with drama or play or music to, uh, as a form of psychotherapy. And so it, it not only is used as a, a soft touch, so for everyday mental health maintenance, but it's also used to work with deep psychological issues issues such as psychosis um, and things like that. So it's actually a very rich form of therapy um, and one of the um, psychotherapy, so the very important approaches towards mental health and well-being. You mentioned psychosis and that makes me think, um, how can somebody who doesn't have contact with reality be able to express themselves through painting or drawing? Or, or how do they engage themselves in it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the art in psych art psychotherapy is really about the process. So the art is used as a vehicle to begin to express yourself and often where words can't be found. Yeah. So there is something about being able to communicate one's feelings in the use of the art materials. But there's also something about how Allah has made the body behave in the fact that we have a conscious and unconscious self. Yes. And even though our unconscious self is much um, much more potent than our conscious self, and we are driven by our unconscious self, our drives, our memories, our feelings. Um, and so art psychotherapy is a way of connecting with the unconscious because the the, the brain, the right side of the brain, is a side of the brain that we use to be creative, but it's also the side of the brain where our deepest memories are stored. So our deepest memories are earliest experiences, and so therefore our earliest understandings of ourselves in relation to others and in relation to the world that we live in. So there's something about those early decisions we made as we were forming as human beings, as personalities, as characters, mm -hmm. that is stored deeply within our right brain. So using art material and creativity mm -hmm. to express oneself without words and tapping into the unconscious is a way of getting to deeply know oneself. That's quite interesting. So is this something that is carried out in a group session or is it something that is done on an individual basis? I, again, it depends on the client group. So for myself, 
I work with um, women that have experienced trauma, as I said earlier, and in the group context, that's not only a way to dispel the isolation of having had an experience and, you know, feeling that, you know, only you have had the experience. Mm -hmm. It's also an opportunity to build positive and wholesome relationships uh, when perhaps through family or intimate partner relationships, that, that feeling of, of a healthy relationship has broken down. So art therapy can be in the group context, just as I've described, but it can also be in a one-to-one -one context. Um, so an opportunity for an individual to talk one-to-one -one with a psychotherapist and begin to explore and unravel you know, narratives, stories, blocks that have um, impacted their lives. So what kind of materials are often used in these um, therapeutic sessions? And I guess in a, in a traditional sense, it's paints, um, uh, uh, pastels, mm. pencils, but more recently, you know, you can use digital material, um, clay is something that's very popular, and uh, some um, artists and art psychotherapists even work with poetry and narrative. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's everything, anything that's creative, really. Yeah, I've heard of poetry therapy and um, creative storytelling and, and journaling. All, all of these, I think, come under that category. So you as a psychotherapist, as an art psychotherapist, Maria, what is your role in this? Do you merely observe um, the client or the patient or do you interpret or give meaning to what they have made and then try to have a conversation? Is there any conversation or communication involved? Yes, yeah, so there is conversation as well. And interpretation and analysis of the art making is not really the purpose of art psychotherapy, but that can be sometimes an integral part. Um, what is the most um, important part of art psychotherapy is, is the same for, for all psychologies. So for all psychotherapy, the opportunity to have an other another person that can hear, acknowledge, see, reflect what is going on for the individual. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's not um, categorical, but often someone that is seeking therapy has had adverse experiences. And sometimes those adverse experiences can be linked back to their earliest experiences. Childhood. The way that they were brought up, childhood, the way, you know, the things that happened um, whilst they were young. And so there is a mirroring of the uh, therapeutic relationship, we call it, uh, where the therapist and client take on a very close relationship where one almost becomes the caregiver whilst the other one is, you know, is has the opportunity to express their need. Mm -hmm. So there is this kind of very interesting connection that takes place. And in between the two, in, the two individuals, because unconscious process is such an integral part of therapy, mm -hmm. there is something that we call the potential space. Mm -hmm. You know, the air around you, the thoughts that are not tangible. So the intangible and metaphysical um, connections that happen within therapy that are, are known as the potential space. I'm just wondering, you know, in, in terms of engaging or motivating somebody to practice art therapy or to get involved with art therapy, is it something that the client or the patient would be interested in and they come to you? Um, what if somebody is not interested, somebody is not motivated enough to draw something or make something or show their creative side? I mean, I have a number of clients that don't engage in art therapy. So I have a number of clients that would rather come for talking therapy. And I have clients that come for art therapy, but seldom, you know, hardly ever create something. And, and that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Because there is an argument that even within art psychotherapy, art making doesn't necessarily have to take place. It doesn't mean that there isn't still a creative approach and a way of using one's imagination to be creative and to un, you know, uh, unravel and explore things more deeply. When you say explore things more deeply at a subconscious or unconscious level, how often do you get to see people um, going through experiences um, where they think of a time or an experience or um, an incident or an event that kind of triggers certain emotions and it surfaces some kind of emotion that is difficult to deal with or maybe the client is not ready to face or acknowledge. How, how do you help them then? 
Well, um, I can give an example of a, a client that I had very recently mm -hmm. who um, came to therapy but was very reluctant because they had had a bad experience before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in just acknowledging that, but recognizing that they have still come to therapy, so there is something that is needed, something that is desired in that exchange. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to be able to just talk gently and work at their pace and kind of explore things as and when they bring them to light. And what also happens with a psychotherapist is that they become attuned and aware when things are not said but expressed. So there may be a, a, a situation where a client is talking quite generally about things but symbolically what they're saying has a deeper meaning. Mm. So somebody with an attuned ear and a greater and heightened awareness of these things can then begin to explore and be quite curious, you know, I wonder what you mean when you say, and then you can begin to unravel. And because it's in that safety and that gentleness, with this particular uh, client that I mentioned, mm. she then felt safe enough to begin to explore things and, and, and quite happy to explore things so you know it's it's not that it's not a forced um endeavor it really is at the pace of the client and according to the client's needs so how is the diagnosis um process um dealt with is it something that that you observe the client first what they're making what they're creating and then come to a conclusion or they already come to you with a diagnosis and that all they need is healing and treatment so i mean again there's another argument about diagnosis and whether diagnosis needs to be mentioned in the space and uh, and the, yes a strong argument for mentioning it in mentioning it in the space if it is something significant that has impacted the client's life so for example if a client has psychosis then that is something that is necessary to to know in the space because um some of the things that the client may say will be hinged to that diagnosis as opposed to somebody let's say that has anxiety yeah. you may still of course want to work gently with that client but you don't want that client to feel that you are managing the diagnosis as opposed to supporting the client with the diagnosis. Yeah. So there are different approaches to it and I, and I don't diagnose. Yeah. So if somebody is referred to me with a particular diagnosis, yeah. I, I bear that in mind, but I work with what the client presents from moment to moment. So for an example, if somebody has schizophrenia, but yeah. in the therapeutic space that doesn't arise or express itself, then I work with what, you know, what comes into the space. I'm curious to know how does it help the client? For example, if someone is presenting symptoms of psychosis or schizophrenia, how is our therapy going to help with their symptoms? Because surely they must be on some kind of medications, right? Yep, so they will be on some kind of medication. Um, but if we're talking about unconscious process and we're talking about behavior that may even be unconscious to the client, mm -hmm. There is a potential that the the medication that they're taking is managing their behavior, but it's not dealing with the whole person. Mm -hmm. So there is something about dealing with the whole person and supporting the whole person, which means that their well-being will be, you know, of a higher degree. Now, I don't work with clients that have psychosis or schizophrenia, so it wouldn't really be fair for me to talk, mm -hmm. you know, quite extensively about that in particular. But when I do work with clients, it's important to recognize that I'm working with the whole person yeah. and that I'm working with what they present in the space and that I'm also supporting them without judgment. Because I think that from the number of clients that I have seen, seen that have been in the system, the medical system for some time, yeah. they feel that they are judged on a label that is given to them via their diagnosis and so therefore they feel unfairly treated because they're not seen as a human being or a whole person yeah. so with therapeutic interventions such as art therapy there is the drive to work with the whole person yeah. you know um, diagnosis and other it sounds like you kind of provide them with a safe space to express their emotions and maybe to acknowledge some of the feelings that maybe they are unable to in a certain kind of environment. So it's more like freedom of expression, freedom of speech, 
um, to bring about their creative side, um, along with things that have been suppressed um, on, on the subconscious or unconscious level. Any interesting case um, you would like to share with us? Um, I, I, w I won't really... I wouldn't really want to talk about sort of any of my clients' cases of because course. they are done in confidence. Um, but it is definitely an opportunity to explore themselves more deeply. And, and let me give an example of in the group context where there's opportunity for an individual to not only share their own story, but to listen to the stories of others. And so in a group context, we will do a check-in, do some art making, and then do some sharing in terms of what has come up for that person during the session. And then other people in the group will often feel that something resonates with them mm -hmm. from the story of what's been shared by another person. So there is something about this mutual exchange that is really rich and this opportunity potentially for somebody else in the space to articulate what one has experienced, what one is thinking, what one is feeling. So it's just a very dynamic space. And there's you know been a lot of research being done on group dynamics and mm -hmm. how a group whatever group it is whether it's a group of students in high school whether it's a group of uh, doctors you know in a multidisciplinary team meeting that there are certain qualities within groups that remain the same someone would be more outspoken someone will hide and not say very much someone yeah. will think they know more than the person that's facilitating or leading you know there are certain qualities and so therefore when you work in groups you see these playing out in a therapeutic space, you want to be able to offer everybody e equality of time, opportunity to express, um, and things like that. So you're working to really manage and balance their experience whilst they're in the space. And it's not very often in society that we find safe spaces, number one, yes. that we can meet with people that will acknowledge us, respect us, and listen to us. Mm. And so these are quite unique spaces, safe spaces for people to come and to explore things in their lives that have, have made it difficult for them to transact and live a, a normal and balanced life. So the opportunity to find spaces like this, few and far between, but incredibly valuable. And like you said, there are um, not many safe spaces for people to express themselves or to even be themselves openly. Um, this just reminds me of um, so many people who may be um, stuck in an environment where they find no source of health, support or hope even, where they feel that they're already kind of stigmatized. In many communities, many cultures, mental health is still kind of a taboo topic. Um, people don't acknowledge that it is as normal as looking after your physical health or just like your physical health can be disrupted, your mental health can be disrupted as well. And there are professionals out there um, who are there to help you, support you in these difficult times. For a person to acknowledge that they need help and then for them to make take that first step towards healing what is your experience as a professional? Um, because there are so many different types of therapies out there. And for, for, for an average person, it may be quite confusing to having to decide who to approach, what kind of therapy is going to suit best. So for our therapy, um, what is it like um, best for depression or anxiety or something else? So all of the the above that you've mentioned, but um, in the groups that I have worked with, especially the ones that I've worked with quite intensely and deeply, for an example, I've worked with um, female survivors of childhood sexual abuse and domestic abuse. Now, these are instances where, you know, trauma has been heightened, the feeling of helplessness has been there for them, mm -hmm. but they have been able to use art therapy, art making, um, engaging with others as an opportunity to have self-healing, to have a sense of recovering from those negative experiences. So it's it can be used across the board, it can be used in, in a number of different ways and I've seen people come away feeling better about themselves mm -hmm. feeling that they have benefited from the experience and that's ultimately what you want to offer someone the opportunity to find a safe space to express and explore because I think often what happens with people with, with all of us our experiences get stuck inside of us mm -hmm. so this opportunity to be able to express and release 
yes. those feelings, the tensions is really important. And the art making serves as a, a, a way of releasing these things that are held inside. The examples that you gave, um, whether it's somebody who has been a victim of intimate partner violence or um, sexual abuse, it's often very difficult for the victim or the survivor to, to talk about these experiences or to go to someone and tell them what they have been through, especially if it happens, say, for example, in childhood by a caregiver or somebody the family trusts. It's very difficult. But to provide a safe space for these individuals to actually express those suppressed emotions that have been suppressed for a very long time. Um, when the breakthrough actually happens and people acknowledge what's happened and as we know that trauma is not the, the incident or the event that has happened, but it's what you experienced, what you experienced after the trauma has passed. How difficult is it or how easy is it for people to be able to live a normal life again after experiencing any traumatic event and going for art therapy? Well, for, from a psychological point of view, the human body, the human being, Allah has created it in such a way that it is so sophisticated and ultimately so resilient. And I think what you'll find is if you were to have if you were to take 20 people into a room randomly from off the street and to speak to them, offer the safe space, offer them the opportunity to express themselves, you probably have, you know, a quarter of those people that have had that those experiences that you speak of, right? Because they are so commonplace. Yes. And people still are able to get on with their everyday lives mm -hmm. because there is something psychological that happens where we split so we split off that side of us that is unbearable and difficult to deal with mm. and we um, exist in another part of ourselves. So it's almost like we still carry that with us. And I often speak to clients about that as a sort of a metaphorical handbag that one is carrying that often is heavy, burdensome mm. and exhausting. But in the split, it's the only way to survive. So you put on your mask, you put on this happy face, and you get on with life, you go to work, you do what you have to do, but there is this dark shadow, let's say, this, this you know, experience. So it's quite commonplace for people to manage it and deal with the everyday. And of course, there will be some people in society that are potentially more sensitive and to therefore can't. And so therefore you may find that it, it could be anxiety, it could be a number of different symptomatic mental health issues that arise because of this split and not being able to manage that very well. So that's that's one way of looking at it. Mm. Another way of looking at it is um, to say that people often want help. Sometimes with the split, it's um, it's ignored or denied. I, I don't need help, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm okay, I've, I'm over it. Denied. But on the other side, there is the fact that yes, they do want the help, but where do they go? And actually it's very difficult, not only to find the right help, but to feel safe enough to begin to explore that route to recovery. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complicated, you know, it's as complicated as we are as human beings. But you know, when somebody does feel brave enough, and I, I say that lightly because it takes courage and brave bravery just to manage those feelings in the everyday, but when someone does feel that they can explore some kind of support or therapy, that in itself can be challenging because you may find a therapist that you don't attune to or that you don't yes. feel yeah. that you can connect with. And I think it's really important for people to recognize they have a choice. I think when you go through, let's say, the NHS system mm -hmm. and you are allocated a therapist yes. or a counselor, there isn't any choice. But if you are looking for one yourself, ask as many questions as you can, ask if you can have an opportunity to try out the session before you commit to it, just so that you can have, you know, the power dynamic is in your hands. You have the options, the choices, and you can make the right choices for you. Um, unfortunately for people who are unable to afford private therapy and they rely on NHS, one, there is a long waiting um, for that. There's a long waiting list. And when they do get their turn, then like you said, sometimes you're not attuned to the therapist or the counselor that 
um, and it just has provided for you. And sometimes due to lack of um, resources, people are encouraged to go for group therapeutic sessions rather than a one-to-one -one session. And a lot of people are not comfortable mm -hmm. in, in, in talking or uh, vocalizing um, really personal, you know, intimate experiences that they have had. And um, a few days ago, there, there was this lady on the show um, as a guest, a wonderful lady who, who went through different, like 15, one, five different types of therapies. So she had 15 different therapists uh, from the age of 19 till she turned like 50 plus until she reached um, a stage when she found the right kind of um, therapy that worked for her because she was a survivor of child sexual abuse and she felt that a lot of professionals did not really understand what the problem was or what's the best treatment intervention for her because there is PTSD and then there is complex post-traumatic stress. That's what she was um, experiencing. So I guess for people to decide where to go and what kind of therapy um, they should opt for is a very difficult thing for somebody who has never been to a therapist before. Oh, absolutely it is. And I, I don't think there's any one straight answer um, in terms of that. And, you know, um, kudos to, to her mm -hmm. for enduring and for being resilient enough to keep trying and to recognise, you know, that her voice and her experience is the ultimate truth, not necessarily what the clinician says, not what the psychologist says or the therapist says. It's what she feels in her body and in her heart, you know, is, is her truth. Mary, one thing I'm really like... Um... It really touches my heart that, mashallah, there are thousands and thousands of mental health professionals around the globe, millions maybe, offering different kinds of support services and, you know, therapies, counseling. But when it comes to looking after their own mental health, and I'm talking about mental health professionals, especially for people like you who are working with um, people who have experienced some form of trauma or maybe a series of traumatic events, how do you look after yourself? Well, um, so for a, a mental health professional, they will always have supervision themselves. So they would be able to talk about their workload and their experiences with clients, with their supervisor, and work through very importantly what has impacted them, but also what of their stuff has entered into you know that therapeutic frame. Also, therapists often go into personal therapy themselves to be able to work through their stuff so that they're constantly working through what's going on for them in order for them to remain aware of their drives, their triggers as human beings yeah. so that they can be safe within the space. And self-care, self-care is critical. The opportunity to be kind and gentle with oneself, to take times of rest, recuperation, creativity, restorative um, activity. So, you know, there are a number of things that healthcare professionals can do. What I've seen across the board is often that these things are not implemented in, in the main, but also in some organisations, the level of support that they offer the mental health professionals that work for them is, is just not quite up to standard. So there are dilemmas and issues in terms of that, um, but there are ways that an individual can keep themselves safe and well. Lots of therapies um, have their limitations in terms of, say, for example, age group. Um, some, therapy, some form of therapies are not suitable for people under the age of 18, for example, because the child's mind is still developing, their cognitions are developing, they may not be able to communicate uh, as, um, you know, properly as an adult does. But when it comes to art therapy or therapeutic storytelling or poetry therapy, is there any limitation? For example, it's only suitable for people above the age of 18 or anything like that. So, I mean, art therapy is probably one of the most common popular therapies in schools, all of the arts psychotherapy so drama therapy art therapy play therapy and music therapy um and again because it's working with the unconscious and children are closer to those earlier somatic memories those earlier deep memories um so so it's a perfect opportunity for them to begin to explore them and and, and be for the intervention the therapy to be restorative enough to give them an opportunity to live a 
more wholesome and balanced life moving forward. So it is an intervention that's used in a lots lots of schools across the country. Um, but so no, to my knowledge, there aren't any limitations in terms of any particular client group or, or individual that can use art psychotherapy. And if somebody is interested in having a private consultation, private session, how cost effective is it for an average person? I, I think that the, the, the question is quite confusing in the sense of you're asking if there is value for money in having a therapeutic session. Um, it's more like for people who may wish to um, go for private therapeutic sessions, but they are concerned that it may be out of reach or maybe it's too costly. Um, so just to kind of tell our viewers how um, approachable it is or how convenient it is. Well, I think that there are some therapists that work by donation so there will there will always be opportunity um to be able to have um sessions that aren't too expensive and i think um spirited minds which is a muslim organization they offer very low priced therapies and and counseling but my argument would be that one would invest in a a nice car probably a flat screen tv and maybe even eating out once or twice a month now, I would um, argue that taking care of oneself, one's body, one's mind, one's spirit, um, and enabling a richer quality of life because one has worked through the things that block and get in the way and cause, that devalue one's sense of life, um, would be worth investing in if it meant, you know, that it could offer that to an individual. So there is something hugely important about thinking about what is important to us and what we value and what we need and I think that we live in a society that's a, a capitalist society it is about accumulation and it is about material things mm -hmm. and it certainly isn't about spiritual development spiritual maturity or spiritual awakening mm -hmm. and I think that therapy or therapeutic intervention is an opportunity to move beyond the lower self and the no lower aspirations of the world and begin to explore oneself more deeply and become aware of one's drives, one's triggers, so that one is empowered to to work through, you know, what limits us um, in life. And so I just think that there is such a huge investment in that kind of exploration, the self-exploration. Um, that I think is, is worth it. And I think uh, it's it's possible to do that without it appearing to be too expensive because what's more expensive, you know, not offering yourself the opportunity to be well, to be better, to feel better, you know, definitely. Yeah. can't put a price on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned spirituality and there are different kinds of therapies out there, but not every single type of therapy um, taps into your unconsciousness or, you know, it doesn't really necessarily help in some kind of areas of your spiritual um, or emotional health, but our therapy does. So how does that take place? How, how can you connect to your inner self through, through art? I mean, I think that all therapies done well do connect with one's unconscious and do connect with one's spirituality. I think if I if I look back at the traditional makeup of Western therapy, for an example, and I think about um, the work of um, Freud and the work of Jung as two of the early instigators of psychodynamics, in particular therapy, um, Freud's approach was very much about the human lower self, you know, our, 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 all that is wrong with us is based on our, our lower selves and our lower drives and our carnal desires. Mm. Whereas Jung's approach was very much about recognizing, yes, we are human beings and we have this bestial nature, but we also have this spiritual connection, this spiritual nature, and it is for us to aspire within that spiritual 
nature to become self-actualized and to tap into and connect to our higher selves. So the art psychotherapy that I practice is linked in with the 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 work and the um, research of Carl Jung mm -hmm. and this notion of um, enlightenment or self-actualization that comes from connecting with one spiritual and higher self. So yes, there are different forms of therapies that yes, they do all in some ways connect with the unconscious. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's again to quiz the, the person that you are looking to have therapy with. I mean, we also have, you know, Islamic st approaches generally as counselling as opposed to psychotherapy. So there is a completely different approach there in terms of how uh, the counsellor engages with the client is very different to how a psychotherapist engages with the client. Um, but so there are approaches out there that um, link into spiritual awareness and awakening and spiritual development. So, so you, know, you know, there's a range to choose from. Again, it all comes back to um, making those choices that people may be so confused or maybe they don't really know what what um, option to choose from. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier on that um, our therapy is used for a range of um, mental health related problems. What about physical health related problems? What about chronic pain, for example, or somebody who is going through a terminal illness? Would they benefit from it? So, yes, I would say that they would. Um, and I would say, for an example, in hospice care, mm -hmm. um, art therapy, again, is very popular. Mm -hmm. And um, the notion of one knowing that, you know, their life is coming to an end, yeah. the anxieties, the feelings that come with that, that have to be, well, that should be supported, Mm -hmm. should be helped to be contained can be done using art therapy or creative means um and there and there's a lot of um, research on that you can probably go online and explore and hear people's testimonies because for an example i recently watched a short film about a woman who um had um a particular illness that meant she was you know she was terminal that she was going to die mm -hmm. and she wanted to film an interview with herself she wanted to take part in the creative process because she not only wanted to help others to be able to manage and come to terms with death i think again we live in a society um where it's about accumulation and ownership mm -hmm. right it's not about letting go or submission um and so therefore this notion of dying is difficult Yes. For, for most of us, you know, we, we don't talk about it, it's, you know, it's taboo. Um, but she wanted to be able to talk about it and she wanted to talk about how she had come to terms with the reality that mm. she was going to die. Now, it's a reality for all of us, you know, yes. that we're going to die, but we, we don't know, but we still live, we're living on a limited clock, you know, we only have a certain amount of moments, days, hours. Um, but to listen to somebody that has submitted to that reality and it has come to terms of it and has, is at peace with it was was hugely powerful so yes art therapy is used again in those kinds of instances where you may have somebody that has that's still quite young for an example that has just been diagnosed with a terminal illness and is finding it difficult to come to terms with it they can use the art making to be able to understand what is is going on for them and how they can work through those really strong feelings of anger frustration mm -hmm. you know about it and so yes it's it's used in in that way and again there's there's a releasing aspect mm -hmm. in the art making you know but it'll be quite beneficial for people um who have lost their memory um for example elderly who've got alzheimer's or parkinson's i think they may be able to benefit from it as well and so then again, that's another area that's very popular with art therapy. And there's something about linking in with, you know, as adults, we lose the ability to be creative and be playful very quickly. You know, you enter into the workspace and you become quite, you know, uh, a particular way of being. You're not no longer playful. You're no longer thinking about create, being creative. You don't feel like, you know, in the main, this is very generalized statements in right now, but you know, you don't want to go home and paint a picture or, you know, draw something, or you don't want to, you know, play with something. But those are the things that keep us fresh and young and help us to feel better 
about life. You know, play and creativity are therapeutic in their own right. So if you can't afford a therapist, but you're frustrated and you're finding it difficult to manage things, just being creative will make you feel better. Just being in nature will make you feel better. Having a chance to express yourself through poetry or, you know, journaling will make you feel better because you are able to release the tensions that are held within. And that's really important. This makes me think about the olden days. And I'm talking about before Freud and before Jung came into existence, going back to thousands of years or maybe a few hundred years ago during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu during the lives of the Aima and al Bayt Alayhi Salam. Surely they had some kind of practice because I think they were closer to nature than we are today because most of us are either glued to our gadgets or after a nine to five job, we come home, we're so drained and exhausted that the last thing you want to do is paint or draw or like you said, do something that connects you with nature. What do you think people used to do back then um, to find healing? when there were no therapies as such, but surely there was some form of healing for people who have experienced pain. I mean, I think if you're thinking about the early Islamic communities, then the Quran was a healing for them. You know, the recitation of it was a healing for them. Prayer was a healing for them. Vicar was a healing for them. And I think we're living in a completely different time now, a time of individualism where, you know, we... Even to say God is unfashionable in some circles. So the, the connection that one has with oneself and with one's creator is a very different thing in this day and age. And I think that um, in that time where people were, were you know, their hearts were, were purer, their attitudes were, were much more upright. You know, Allah speaks in the Quran about few, few of the people of modern times, but many of those from the past, because they had something that we don't have. Right. And so I, I can't speak of or to that other than to say that that time was a different time and what they had was actually of benefit to them in a way that we get lost, like you say, within the gadgets, within the capitalist society, within the acquisition of goods, within the, you know, striving for the better job, the bigger car, the bigger house, you know, um, and so therefore it, it's just a different time. And so therefore the sickness of the heart, the body, the mind, the spirit yes. now needs support in a way that perhaps we didn't then. I think there is a greater need for people to understand that the mind and the body are inseparable. And if you want to truly find healing, whether it's for your physical ailments or for your mental health related difficulties, you have to combine the two. You have to look after your, your body and your mind as a whole. And, um, the lovely examples that you gave of how we can benefit from, um, you know, things as simple as creative writing, journaling, painting, drawing. What other alternatives do people have who, who live a really busy life and after work they come home and they've got other commitments around their families, children? How can they find um, some, some moment of peace and contentment? I know you spoke about Vikr and recitation of the Quran and supplications and dua. And I'm, like most of us do that. But still, I think there is this um, emptiness inside that needs to be filled. And again, there's no one answer. But I think, as Imam Ali salam, says, the answer with, is within you, the medicine is within you, it's for you to seek it out. So there is something about being with oneself, whether it's in prayer, in meditation, in quiet reflection, that, you know, inshallah, can enable that healing to arise uh, but there is also something in recognizing not only that Allah is in total control of course um, but do we practice that do we practice the truth that Allah is in total control to the extent that we may fast and say that we are purified because we fast but we don't recognize that Allah as he says in the Quran, you know, it was not you that threw the stone, Allah threw it. Allah is the instigator of that purification. So there's something in our mindset and in our focus that makes us feel that we are the doer when Allah is ultimately the doer. So there's something about turning back to Allah and saying, I'm in total need of you to heal me, restore me, resolve me. And so I'm thinking in terms of 
again, I'm going to go back to fasting and the, the purification of oneself, that we fast, pray, or do any form of ibadah so that we can ready ourselves for Allah yeah. to purify us, forgive us, resolve us. Mm -hmm. So there's something about just trusting the process, you know, and being in a state of quiet reflection, dhikr, but turning to and seeking Allah's oneness and grace mm -hmm. that is where the healing is. Um, and maybe that feeling of emptiness is because we can't do it ourselves. But in kind of switching that perspective and saying, actually, yes, okay, I, I can't do it myself. And that's why I feel this emptiness. And turning back to Allah and saying, Allah, please do this. It, that maybe that's where the healing is. But again, each individual is different. Each need is different. Um, and again, Allah has placed within each of us the kernel and truth of what that need is and how to resolve it. And, you know, inshallah, by Allah's grace, we can be resolved. But we often do need support. You know, we are communal beings. We need community, we need each other. Mm -hmm. So it is important also to have a listening ear or, or somewhere we can go to find some form of support as well. And I guess that's another thing, um, active listening. It's, it's a skill that many people unfortunately still do not have. And to be an active listener, you have to be patient in, in terms of listening to what other person has to say, not just because you are waiting to reply, but just to listen, just to hear them out and allow them to express themselves um, in, in a space where they feel safe and secure to share their emotions with. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned that it's extremely important for us as believers to practice all the things that have been made obligatory because it's for our own well-being, for our own good. But for people who have experienced some really bad traumatic experiences in their life, whether in their childhood or maybe later adulthood, for them to find healing just through, say for example, making dua or reciting the Quran is not enough on its own. They need, like you said, support from the community. They need help from, from professionals. And it's only when you go through, go for like holistic approach, then only you'll be able to fully recover and heal. And healing is such a, long journey doesn't happen overnight and i'm sure you know this i mean you mashallah you're a you're a therapist just i mean you do this for like um for a living um how difficult it is for people to you know go through that healing journey and finally reach that goal where they can live a fulfilling life again so is that a question how difficult it is or is that a statement yes. Yes. It's a difficult question. Oh, yeah. No, of course, it, it it is difficult, it is challenging, but um, it's not impossible. And I think I've worked with a number of people and some people want to heal and recover and some people don't believe that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really about, and I, and I always feel in talking to different people, there is an, an element of choice in how one progresses on the path of healing and recovery, right? So it, it's not gonna be easy. Sometimes it's gonna be messy. Sometimes it's gonna be painful. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you have to make a choice as to whether you want to withstand that to be able to be on the other side and to be better. Now, I just wanna go back to what you said about active listening. There is a reason that there is such a profession as psychotherapy, because actually we can't lean on our spouse, our mother, our you know relatives, siblings to listen to us and expect them to be able to be there for us at all times. It's important that even the things that we need to discuss, we don't allow them to get in the way of our everyday relationships. So we take them somewhere else and we have these private focused intense relationships with a professional that can hold them in confidentiality and so that we can leave them yeah. so that we can be released of these feelings of these thoughts of these anxieties and we can leave them there and move on lighter so there is you know something in that process of engaging with someone in order to heal um and the journey doesn't have to be or feel impossible mm -hmm. you can set the pace the tone with your therapist counselor and say actually 
you know, I, I want to be gentle about this. I don't want to bring off anything too heavy. I, you know, and, and that is your choice. You can you can set the tone in terms of that. And people have different flavors and different ways of being. Mm -hmm. So there is also opportunity to be able to kind of feel out whether it's right for you at first as well. There is a rise in self-harming behavior amongst youth. Um, it, it's, it's something which is rising on, the, on a daily basis because young people often find it difficult to speak to their parents or siblings. They often don't know how to express or they feel scared or fearful that if they may share certain things, the parents will get angry or upset. And then for them, the only coping mechanism that they can find to deal with that pain is to, you know, harm themselves. Is art therapy something that may help them with managing these difficult emotions? Yes. So, I mean, it's not just young people that self-harm. There are, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s that also feel that this is a way of self-regulation. Um, and so art therapy is used in that way as well. I think that any intervention that offers a safe, confidential space and an opportunity to explore what drives a person to behave in a particular way mm -hmm. has the um, potential to create a change for them to no longer need to do that. Um, and often the drives are very deeply set, you know, in, in um, understandings of oneself and early experiences in the world and a sense of um, value of oneself that has often been projected on them by other people. So there, there are ways of working around those feelings and those experiences that can help to improve one's way of being. Jazakumullah Khairan, Mariam, thank you so much for today's, um, you know, insightful talk. And um, I'm sure our viewers must have really found it insightful too. If um, any of you would like to contact Sister Maria, if you have any feedback to share, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to call in our studio. You can also leave your feedback and your comments on our Hidat TV's Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, Sister Maria, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate um, your coming in today and um, speaking with us. Thank you for having me, Martha. Um, to all our lovely viewers who are watching this program, I'll join you again next Saturday with another guest and another topic around your mental health. If there's any specific topic that you would like me to cover, please share your feedback and comments and we'll definitely get back to you. Till next Saturday, look after your mental health. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.